Yeah. Okay. Um, In the meantime, the, the room has packed up. Yeah. Wow. I will briefly introduce you. Okay. If that's all right. Yeah. All right. Don't feel compelled to read. You know everything. <laughs> it would take forever. Uh, I will just hold the microphone. That makes it much easier for me. It's okay. That works. Very good. Happy. Thank you. Can I use this one? Well, here you can use one? that, and then and then uh, you can uh, hand it to me, and I'll go sit somewhere here, get out of your way. So this is very amusing that yeah. we couldn't get the PC to display either the PowerPoint or the PDF, which is very surprising. The Probably has to do with the formatting of your stick. Yeah, well, the uh, PowerPoint, I, I understand, could be a problem because although it's a Microsoft product on the Macintosh, it doesn't work exactly the same as on the PC. The files are pretty compatible, but it's yeah, but this time it wouldn't, it couldn't read either the one USB of them. Stick is well, no, because it worked yesterday. So yeah, you know, on a PC. No, yes, on a PC. So I don't know. No time to investigate. It's a wonderful example of how yeah. standards don't always work. Don't you uh, prefer to have all the data on the cloud and then? Well, uh, yes, exactly. And then you don't, don't have this you don't have this problem with yeah. connectors and everything else. Yeah. That's why I'm uh, hoping to get the projection units should be on uh, Wi-Fi, yeah. so you can just uh, connect to them and then put the put the presentation up that way. I haven't understood why they haven't done that. Yet. Uh, well, you know, they're slowly getting there. The pr um, printers are finally getting to the point where they're available through the cloud. And so I think projection units are the next obvious uh, choice. Good heavens, well, we got quite a turnout, didn't we? Somebody must think I'm actually going to say something useful. I don't know. This One week ago, it was like 100 people registered. Since this week, it, it, it just went exploded. Went. To, uh, <laughs> finally started to realize who you were. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, well, I, I, I always worry that people have very high expectations and that I won't fulfill them and they will be disappointed. Yeah, which is, sure. yeah but many nervous. of them are students. Ah, uh, okay. Well, Staff yes. members oh, so if they're students, they have low expectations of all lectures, right? <laughs> if you can set yourself above the average student lecture, oh, with formulas. Oh, well, yes. So this is actually, uh, this uh, periodic table of the elements is uh, very interesting. The, uh, we get all the way up now to 111. Gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear students, researchers, um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Peter Gauck, I'm the current head of the Interdisciplinary Center for Law and ICT, here at the Law Faculty of the Kai Leuven Center, Research Center, which is part of LICT, the Leuven Information and Communication Technology Center, which is chaired by Professor Hill, who is sitting here in front with us. I'm very happy to see that you are here so numerous. Initially, we thought to keep this an intimate lecture, and we had reserved a very fancy small room, but registrations kept coming in, uh, despite uh, very little promotion, actually. So we had to move locations twice, um, and now we are, of course, extremely happy to see you all here, full of excitement for this lecture, and so I would like to welcome you on behalf of Ikri Licht and Kai Leuven. I'm also very happy to see uh, or to welcome some of the IBBT colleagues who are in the room, and um, it is my special honor to introduce you to our very distinguished lecturer of today, Mr. Jim Seth, although I'm confident that he hardly needs any introduction being considered as one of the founding fathers of the Internet, having served as founding president and chairman of the board of the Internet Society, as well as chairman of the board of ICANN, I think his name and fame have a global reach. Since 2005, Mr. Sir uh, served as a vice president for Google, be responsible for identifying new enabling technologies um, to support the development of advanced internet-based products and services. His lecture um, will take about 40 minutes and will focus on these challenges for the future of the internet. 
Mr. Sturf will be happy to take a couple of questions from you afterwards in relation to his lecture. As you will undoubtedly understand, he is not in a position to answer any questions in relation to the current services or future business plans of Google. <laughs> Mr. Sturf, it is a great honor to have you here in Leuven today uh, at our university. I am very glad to pass the floor to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, let's do Guten Morgen, and Bonjour, and that's all of the non-English you're going to get this morning. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for, uh, for joining us this morning. Uh, I, having now heard the saga of moving from one room to another, I have the uh, worry that you have expectations that are well beyond what I will be able to satisfy this morning. Uh, so I hope that you aren't armed with any uh, rotten eggs and tomatoes and things like that. What I hope to do uh, this morning is to give you just a tiny flavor of the historical development of the net. I want to focus mostly on the current state of affairs in the network, what's happening to it, the changes that are taking place. Uh, I also want very much to draw your attention to policy issues which the internet has highlighted. This is a technology which is quite different from almost all other uh, communications technologies that we have experienced in the past. And so it shouldn't be a surprise to any of us that this digital environment, which uh, embodies the internet, uh, poses some fairly hard uh, legal and philosophical challenges uh, that we have not yet figured out how to uh, overcome. So uh, I understand that uh, many of you are uh, engineers or computer scientists and others of you are involved in the law and both of these domains interact uh, in the uh, internet world. So let me just begin by giving you a, um, oh, I see, I, this thing is, there we are, here we are. So this is, an, an, it's an eye chart. You're not expected to uh, look in any of the details. I wanted to just give you a, a sense for the evolution of the system. It started out as a project um, by, led by the American uh, Defense Department, Advanced Research Projects Agency. So there were four computers that were connected together in December of 1969. One machine was at UCLA, another at uh, Stanford Research Institute, a third one at UC Santa Barbara, and the fourth one at University of Utah. I was a graduate student in 1969 uh, at UCLA, and I was responsible for writing the software to connect the Sigma 7 computer to the first node of the ARPANET. Uh, after that four-node system was in place, and uh, the packet switching technology upon which it was based showed uh, its ability to allow uh, interactive operation among these four time-shared machines, we expanded the, uh, the system. And you could see that it, by 1977, two big things had happened. The first thing is that we had gone from this uh, homogeneous ARPANET system to a heterogeneous networking environment. We had to invent a new suite of protocols to allow for multiple networks to be interconnected. Those are called TCP IP. My partner, Bob Kahn, and I did the original design in 1973. By 1977, we had three very different kinds of packet switch nets in operation. We had a mobile packet switch network, with, um, vehicles that were driving around in the San Francisco Bay Area radiating packets <laughs> over the air. We had the wireline ARPANET, which had, by that time had been in operation for nearly eight years. And we had a packet satellite system with a shared satellite uh, channel and multiple ground stations competing for access to that system. The SatNet program connected the western part of Europe to the eastern part of the United States. And these all three of these networks were interconnected to each other. So on November 22nd, 1977, we had the first demonstration that the TCP IP protocols could link three very different packet switch nets to each other. Uh, by 1982, uh, all the systems are beginning to grow, and we are just about to force everyone in the Defense Department-sponsored uh, systems to switch over to the TCP IP protocols. So what you know of as the Internet was born operationally on January 1st, 1983. 
So this is now very nearly 30 years ago that we turned on the, uh, the internet that you're using today. For all practical purposes, the system that you uh, are using was standardized in 1978. <coughs> the um, application that you use mostly, which is the World Wide Web, doesn't come along until about 1989. So there's a period of time um, before we see the internet as you now know it today, but the underlying basic system was operational in January of 83. By 1986, we had many different parties who uh, were interested, including the academic uh, community in the United States, sponsored by uh, the National Science Foundation. When you get to 1999, you begin to see a significant amount of use uh, around the world. Now, I should tell you that when Bob Kahn and I did the original design of the system, we had the idea that we should simply release the detailed design to the world without any constraints, no patents, no copyrights, simply release the details and let anyone who wanted to build a piece of internet and then try to find someone to connect to. And our idea was that if we made the barriers to uh, implementation of pieces of internet very low, that people would simply build it and find ways to interconnect. So we had a very organic view of how the internet would evolve. And I would say that that view has borne out, uh, been borne out over time because the network has continued to grow at a fairly dramatic pace. By the time you get to 2012, the internet looks like this. And this is a picture of the uh, connectivity, global connectivity of the internet. There are 400,000 networks that are interconnected around the world, not counting the little one that you have at home, the little Wi-Fi system that you're probably running. These are our ISPs that uh, are operating on behalf of others. There are about 2.3 billion people who are online. In fact, if we look at the uh, scale of the system, starting with the 1969 early, uh, early days of a few computers uh, and, a few, uh, and one network, now we see a fairly large number of machines on the network. And there are an estimated 888 million machines that are visible on the public internet. But those are just the machines that have domain names and fixed IP addresses. That doesn't count all the things that are episodically connected like laptops or desktops or iPads or mobiles that come and go on the network. If you include all of those devices, we're probably looking at two to possibly even three billion uh, devices that are on the network. That number is going to escalate uh, over time. Um, the other thing which is very important for the last decade or so has been the introduction of mobile technology. There are five and a half billion or so mobiles in use today. Not all of them are internet capable, but probably 20 to 25 percent are. And over time, that percentage will go up. The reason that's important is that for many people, their first introduction to the internet comes through a mobile as opposed to a desktop or a laptop or an iPad. For many, uh, it will stay that way, and for others, they will begin to accumulate other devices that they will use in addition to their mobiles. But that adds a huge demand for address space on the network, because if every mobile that's internet enabled has to have an IP address assigned, eventually uh, you start to run out of IP addresses. And in fact, that's what we're faced with today. Uh, we uh, chose a 32-bit address space in 1973 in order to carry out an experiment. And I want to emphasize that we thought this was an experiment. What I thought was that if the experiment succeeded, then we would design a production version of the system. Well, the problem is that the, the experiment never ended, and so we're still using the experimental internet, which only had 4.3 billion terminations built into its design. So in 1996, in a great panic, uh, we developed, and here we in this case is not Bob and me, but rather the Internet Engineering Task Force, developed an alternative packet format called IP version 6. Uh, it has 128 bits of address space. And if you do the math, that's 3.4 times 10 to the 38th addresses. This is a number only the parliament can appreciate. Um, we are now in the process of introducing, in parallel with IP version 4, the IP version 6 formats. So on June 8th last year, in 2011, 
uh, many of us in the internet community turned on the IPv6 uh, capabilities that we had in addition to running IP version 4. On June 6th this year, all of us are going to turn on IPv6 and leave it on. So this is a very big year for the internet because IP version 6 internet will be launched on June 6th. Uh, Google and many others have been preparing for this uh, over the course of uh, several years and uh, we're all looking forward to seeing what happens when we turn this on and, and leave it on permanently. You know, this is a really interesting display format because I can't see anything on the, on the slides in front of me. I have to keep looking up here and I want to go back to that for just a second. Um, in terms of growth rate, there was a period of time starting around 1988 when the internet was doubling every year, 100% growth in number of people, and number of computers, and number of networks that were present. Over the last dozen years, it has uh, been growing at a much more sedate pace, about 15% per year compounded annually. If that growth rate continues for the rest of the decade, virtually everyone in the world will be online on the internet, at least up to the point where people, some people decide they don't want to be on at all. And in the United States, we've sort of reached a plateau of about 80% of the population are online and the other 20% don't seem to care. That may happen on a global basis too, but we're still far away from uh, touching the seven billion people that uh, are on the planet. So this is sort of the kind of scaling that's going on in the net today. Here's another uh, major change in the network. Uh, work on this was begun almost a decade ago in 2003. Uh, it was refined uh, between 2008 and 2010. For many, many years, the domain names of the internet were uh, written only using the Latin characters A through Z, the hyphen, and the digits zero through nine. Those were the only symbols that were permitted in the domain name system. But as the internet had become increasingly available around the world, there was natural pressure to find a way to express domain names in uh, uh, character sets drawn from other languages. So we introduced the use of Unicode, which by the way is also used in the World Wide Web. So the web can show uh, information in uh, literally hundreds of languages. We wanted the domain name system to have the same capability. The Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, which was responsible for overseeing the domain name system, has started introducing new uh, domain names uh, in these non-Latin characters. So you'll see Chinese and Cyrillic and Hebrew and Arabic and so on uh, showing up uh, in the system as well as the, uh, the more common Latin character names. Uh, there are some trends that I think are worthy of your attention. Uh, they have to do primarily with the fact that the uh, internet is capable of carrying virtually all forms of previously invented media. Now, it's probably an ironic that the reason that the internet is so versatile is that it was not designed to do anything in particular. It was not designed with a specific application in mind. In fact, all Bob Kahn and I asked was that the underlying network carry a little bag of bits from point A to point B with some probability greater than zero. That's all we asked of the underlying <laughs> transmission system. All of the recovery from losses and failure and disordering and duplication would be taken care of on an end-to-end -end basis, which is what the TCP, Transmission Control Protocol, was all about. The fact that the net doesn't uh, know what it's carrying is actually important because if you wanted to invent a new application, you don't have to change the network to do that. It just delivers these little electronic postcards full of bits. And it doesn't know that those bits should be interpreted as voice or video or text or a piece of a web page or part of an image or maybe a piece of, uh, of a film. So uh, this ignorance of, in the underlying network allows it to support virtually any application that you can think of that it can be communicated in a digital way. There's another uh, ignorance that shows up that's turned out to be very powerful and it was also very deliberate. We knew in 1973 when we were designing the system that there would be new communication technologies coming along that we didn't know about. 
in 1973, there were uh, typical uh, bandwidths that you could get were one and a half megabits to two megabits a second uh, on the telephone system with dedicated circuits. But in the interim period from 1973 to 40 years later, things like uh, asynchronous transfer mode have come along, multi-protocol label systems have come along, optical fiber have come along, a variety of uh, wireless communications have come along at increasingly high bandwidths. So we said the packets should not know how they're being carried. The packet should have no knowledge of what the underlying system was. That ignorance has allowed us to sweep into the internet every new communication technology that's come along, as long as it can carry a bag of bits from point A to point B with some probability greater than zero. So the system is that it uses the ignorance in order to be flexible and to adapt to new applications and to new communications technologies. There was an article written by a friend of mine, uh, uh, Mr. Eisenberg, called The Rise of the Stupid Network. And in fact, that's exactly what this is. It's a stupid network and we take advantage of that. Uh, there are uh, other kinds of things that are happening now. As, as these media, all of them, are carried on uh, internet packets, all of the previous regimes that were focused on specific applications, the telephone network designed and built for telephony, but not built for a variety of other applications, or the cable television network uh, designed and built to deliver streaming video. All of those regimes for regulating and managing and operating systems are no longer applicable because the internet does all of these things and it does it in a different way than the purpose-built networks do. The other thing that we can see happening is that uh, when you uh, make this kind of system available to, uh, on a global scale, you create opportunities for collaboration which wouldn't exist otherwise. In the postal system, for example, you have to know the address of the party that you want to communicate with. In the telephone system, you have to know a telephone number of the party you want to call. In the internet environment, especially in the World Wide Web environment, you don't necessarily need to know the identity of the people that you uh, be, are interested in interacting with. If you go to a particular website, for example, that is uh, about a particular topic, you may find yourself interacting with people whose names you don't know and whose names you might never know because they have identifiers that have nothing to do with who they are. And yet you're having this communication with them because you're sharing posts on a blog site or you're commenting on something that someone else has done or you're uploading data that you've collected in a scientific uh, uh, experiment for, to allow other people to reproduce the results. So this ability to collaborate and to discover people that you don't know ahead of time is an extremely powerful tool. You can see the social networking consequences as you look at Google Plus and Facebook and some of the other, MySpace and others. This ability to discover people that you don't know ahead of time and to communicate with uh, people that have a shared interest in uh, some common topic uh, is uh, very different from the other technologies that we've experienced in the past. Impl this implies that um, we are going to have to live through this experience in order to establish social norms in a digital world that we never had to confront in the more uh, typical world of the past. And I'll come back to that topic in a bit. Another thing which is very clear is that artificial intelligence has come a very, very long way from its origins in the 1960s. I can recall being on the Stanford campus uh, in the early 1960s where uh, people like John McCarthy uh, and Edward Feigenbaum and others who were uh, really founders of artificial intelligence had hopes that some, at some point uh, we would be able to translate languages from one to another. We had the simple idea that if you just put the dictionary into the computer that it would translate for you. And so we tried a few naive experiments. I think we put in a, a uh, Russian-English dictionary uh, into the computer and then we presented the, uh, the computer with a simple expression. Now there's a famous English language uh, expression, out of sight, out of mind, meaning if, you, if someone isn't nearby, you sort of forget about them. So we put that out of sight, out of mind into the system, translated it into Russian, and then we translated it back into English, and it came back, invisible idiot. Uh, 
<laughs> and so well, clearly there is something missing here. In the 40 year interim, we have come a very, very long way in our ability to translate from one language to another. I'll give you a few examples of that uh, in a few minutes time. Uh, we also are experiencing uh, an increasing interest in online digital publication. Because this digital medium can handle everything, whether it's sound or, or video or print material and so on, um, and it does so cheaply. The economics of digital are incredibly cheap compared to you know, paper, for example, or cassettes or DVDs and everything else. The online distribution is inexpensive. The replication is inexpensive. And the consequence of that is, A, the economics are different, and B, we now get to the point where we're no longer confined to the features of those older media. So we have, it, we have objects that can uh, be rendered as a combination of all these various media. Video games are probably a good example of this. It's a very interactive system. You're seeing video, you're hearing sound. You may actually be talking to someone else who is playing a game with you. Uh, this is an incredibly rich, uh, multiple media environment and it's all feasible because everything is being turned into packets and being transmitted back and forth. Uh, so digital publication is becoming a big deal. Uh, Amazon uh, reported last year that more than 50% of all the books that it sold were online books going into Kindle as opposed to physical paper. I actually lost a $10,000 bet on that because I thought that would happen in 2010. So. Fortunately, it was the bet that when the money went to a charity, so I don't feel too bad about that. Now, there is a problem which this digital publication environment poses. Each of you, when you are working with an application that produces content, for example, a text document or a spreadsheet or maybe it's a video, every one of the objects that you create in digital form turns into a file sitting on a computer somewhere. The file is full of bits. We know that we can copy the file from one medium to another. You can put the file on a memory stick, you can put it on a DVD, you can put it into another computer and it's uh, you know, RAM, random access memory or it's disk memory. So you can store the bits in a variety of different ways. The bits are not very interesting unless you have access to the application that produced them. Now therein lies a problem and a hazard. You spend a fair amount of your time in front of a computer creating objects using these applications. You invest time and energy, maybe it's a, a PhD dissertation, maybe it's a novel, maybe it's a movie, maybe it's a blog, it could be any of the things that you do on a regular basis. Those application programs typically require an operating system in order to run them. And the operating system requires a platform, a physical platform in which to operate. Those objects, the physical platform, the operating system, and the applications evolve over time. The, the people who make the operating systems and make the hardware platforms keep adding new capabilities. They keep evolving. At some point, it can happen that the new operating system won't run the old application. And if you find yourself coerced to move to the next level of the operating system because the older ones are not being supported, you may suddenly find you can't run the application that you invested so much time and energy in to create all these digital objects. At that point, this digital object, this, this bag of bits, is really a bag of rotten bits because they can't be interpreted anymore. This has a lot of serious economic consequences. It has a lot of you know, you know, psychological stress. Uh, it also has terrible harm to the historians who now lose the ability to understand what was going on in the past because the digital objects that documented those things are no longer interpretable. So I call this the bit rot problem. It's a non-trivial problem to solve and you are a particularly good mix of community to address the problem. There are legal issues and there are technological issues to solve the bit rot problem. The legal issues have to do with intellectual property. Example, you have an application, it has source code, uh, it, uh, and you've used it to create all kinds of objects. 
and the vendor of the application says, I'm upgrading to a new version of the application. And I'm sorry, but it doesn't recognize some of the older formats. We had that problem this morning. There was a PC here. It failed to understand a PDF file and a PowerPoint file created by a Macintosh, which is why I had to bring the Mac up to plug it in. It's a trivial example of this kind of dis dislocation that's happening. So the, the vendor of this application software says, I'm upgrading to something new. I'm not going to support the older stuff anymore. And you're saying, wait a minute, uh, I have a lot of investment in this stuff. Do you have a way of translating from the old format to the new? Sometimes you'll get lucky and they will say yes. Sometimes they'll say no, but somebody else will find a way to do that. And sometimes there just isn't any way. Some of you may have image files uh, from, taken from some years ago. I'm already starting to encounter the problem that the new uh, photograph management systems do not always recognize all the older uh, formats of images taken by various digital cameras from 10 or 15 years ago. So this is a serious problem. Uh, if you say to the vendor uh, who isn't making uh, an application that works with your older material, can I have the source code? so I can at least run the older version, the answer will be no, because that's our property. We don't want you to have source code. Uh, in, at this point, you're very frustrated because you don't seem to have any avenue for solving the problem. Now, it gets worse. When the operating systems change and don't run the old applications, uh, and because the application and the operating system people are completely independent of each other, now you have a different problem and you would like to keep running the older operating system, except that it's not supported anymore. This scenario eventually leads you to imagine that cloud computing might be a kind of solution. You might have to emulate the hardware to run the older operating system, to run the older application, to interpret the bits in the files that you created. And the cloud may actually be the place where all this old stuff can be reproduced uh, and recognized. So I'm, I, you could, we could go on and on. I'm not going to do that on this particular point. But this is a really hard problem because it has so many different technical and legal questions associated with it. We have to solve it because if we don't, our descendants will wonder about us. They won't be able to know what it was that we did because all the history will be wrapped up in digital files that no one can interpret. I think the final observation I want to make on this slide anyway is that we are living in a digital environment where we are interacting with each other in ways that we never could before. We upload images into Flickr, for example, or Facebook or Google+. Uh, we share information uh, and we inadvertently implicate other people. So if you take a photograph, uh, maybe you've asked someone to take a picture of you standing in front of the Great Pyramid of Giza in, in Cairo, and in that image, not only is you and the pyramid, but some other people that you don't know and you don't care about. And you upload this image to, you know, let's say, Facebook. Somebody comes along, is looking for pictures of pyramids, doesn't care who you are, but happens to recognize the person standing next to you, and then tags that person. And now someone else comes along looking for tags of that person and discovers that person sitting in front of the pyramids in Egypt on a certain date and time and says, gee, they told me that they were in London at that time. Now that person is in trouble. There's a series of innocent actions taken in that uh, scenario, no one of which looks like it's harmful, but the consequence is a party who you don't know has suddenly been affected by an image that was posted and tagged by several different people. I don't think we have a clue right now about the proper social norms for operating in this online environment. And I don't even think we can analyze our way into figuring this out. I honestly believe we're going to have to live through this. We'll have to experience some of the harmful effects in order to come to a conclusion about what social norms we want to adopt on a global scale. And so I don't have any prescriptions here at all. I think just to warn you, we're going to have to live through this. I, frankly, I think this is like raising teenagers. You don't know how to do it. You just live through it, and then someday they turn into people. Uh, so, <laughs> all right. Now, let me switch over to the other side of what's happening. Uh, you'll hear the phrase Internet of Things, I'm sure. 
uh, I have been watching with some interest the kinds of devices that are starting to show up on the internet. Things like refrigerators and picture frames, telephones that aren't really telephones, they're voice over IP computers. I often wondered what would an internet enabled refrigerator do? Uh, and I, I guess, well, it has a nice touch sensitive display on the front of the refrigerator door. Now, in America, the American communication, family communication system is usually done with paper and magnets on the front of the refrigerator. So you have this thing covered with pictures that the kids drew at school and notes and reminders to take the garbage out on Tuesday. Now we can augment all that with blogs and uh, email and web pages and the like. But I thought, you know, if the refrigerator knew what it had inside, uh, it could be even more uh, useful. So if you put RFID chips on everything that goes into the refrigerator, the refrigerator would now know what it has inside. So while you're off at school or working, it can be surfing the net looking for recipes that it knows it can make with what it has inside. So when you come home, you would see a list of things that you could have for dinner. Now, you could extrapolate this. Uh, you can imagine being on vacation and getting an email from your refrigerator <laughs> saying, you know, I don't know how long ago you put the milk in here, but if you don't come home, it's going to walk out on its own. <laughs> or maybe you're shopping and your mobile goes off. It's the refrigerator again. Don't forget the marinara sauce. I have everything else we need for spaghetti dinner tonight. Now, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you the Japanese have spoiled this uh, you know, scenario. They've invented an internet-enabled bathroom scale. And you know, so you step on the scale, and, and it figures out which family member you are based on your weight, and it sends that information to the doctor, and it becomes part of your medical record, which sounds OK, except that the refrigerator is on the same network. <laughs> so. So when you come home, you see diet recipes coming up on the, or maybe it just refuses to open because you're not supposed to eat anything. Uh, I used to tell, oh, I should tell you that this is a fellow in the middle here. I, I don't know who he is. Someone said he's Dutch, uh, but he invented an internet enabled surfboard. And I, all I can imagine is he's sitting on the water waiting for the next wave to come thinking, you know, if I had a laptop in my surfboard, I could be surfing the internet while I'm waiting for, for the next wave. So he put a laptop into the surfboard and put a Wi-Fi service back at the rescue shack on the beach, and now he sells this as a product. So if you're interested in surfing the net while you're out on the water, this is for you. I used to tell jokes about internet-enabled light bulbs, thinking, you know, ha ha, someday every light bulb, uh, light bulb will have its own IP address. Well, guess what? Somebody sent me an internet IPv6 enabled light bulb the other day. It's an LED bulb. It probably costs $20. It will last probably 15 years. And because it's an expensive light bulb, putting in the internet radio was only about 50 cents or maybe a dollar. So the you know, relative cost is actually not too high. Uh, this system now allows you to either change the state of the light bulb or detect the state of the light bulb remotely. But this is just the beginning of internet-enabled appliances showing up in, in the network environment. That's why this Internet of Things is important. One thing which I believe is really critical is to appreciate that once you put devices up on the net, not only can you manage them, but third parties can also do that for you. So if you think about your entertainment equipment, if you're like me, you have a number of devices at home. They're remotely controlled with little infrared systems. And I fumble around trying to figure out which remote controller goes with which box. And by the time I figure it out, that I discover that's the remote control with a dead battery. So I'm proposing that we should put all these devices up on the net. We should use our mobiles in order to manage them. And we can turn to third parties and say, will you please take care of getting the movies and the audio or video and what have you that I want on these different uh, entertainment devices? Take care of that for me, will you? I'll just go to a web page and click off the things that I would like to see or listen to, and this third party takes care of uh, managing that. Now, it's pretty clear that you want what's called strong access control so that the 15-year-old next door doesn't reprogram your entertainment equipment while you're off doing something else. So strong authentication using public key cryptography is a very important element in all of that. But here's another example of the kinds of things that are happening in the net. This is a sensor network, which I happen to have installed in the house. It's running IPv6. It is radio-based. Each sensor is literally running on a small Unix uh, device. 
It's about the size of a package of cigarettes. Each sensor uh, has its own operating system. It acts as a store and forward mesh relay, so it builds automatically a topology of connectivity uh, in the house. Every five minutes, it's sampling the light levels, the temperature, and the humidity in each room where one of these devices is located. And then it reports that information back to a server that I have mounted in a rack of equipment in the basement. Now, I understand only a geek would do this, but the whole idea is that by the end of the year, I have really good engineering information about how, how well my heating and ventilation and air conditioning system has worked. So when it comes time to adjust uh, the system, I have real engineering data as, as opposed to anecdotal uh, stories about a room being hot in the summer or too cold during the winter. Uh, so I got to thinking about this because one of the rooms in my house is the wine cellar. This is a very important room for me. It has a few thousand bottles in it, and uh, I need to keep it below 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So if the temperature goes up above 60 degrees, I get an SMS on my mobile. This actually happened while I was visiting uh, Argonne National Laboratory a year or two ago. As I was walking into the building for a three-day visit, the mobile went off. It was the wine cellar calling, uh, saying, I've just gone through the 60 degree Fahrenheit barrier. The cooling system had failed. Unfortunately, my wife was away for two weeks, so there was no one at home to reset the uh, cooling system. So every five minutes for the next three days, I got a message saying your wine is getting warmer. <laughs> By the time I got home, it was 70 degrees in the wine cellar, which is not the end of the world, but it's not good. So I called the people who make the system. This, this is a commercial system made by a company called Artrock, which was acquired by Cisco Systems a, uh, a year or so ago. So this is not me in the garage with a soldering iron. Uh, and I said, do you make remote actuators? And they said, yes. And I said, is it strongly authenticated? Because I have this 15-year-old next door that I worry about. And they said, yes. So this is a weekend project to put in the remote control to reset the cooling system. But then I got to thinking, gee, you know, I can, when I'm away, I can actually tell if somebody's gone into the wine cellar because I can see the lights go off and on. But I don't know what they did in there. So I thought, OK, so why don't I put an RFID chip on each bottle? in the wine cellar. And then I could do an instantaneous inventory to find out if any wine has left the wine cellar without my permission. And I was explaining this design to an engineering friend of mine who pointed out to me that there was a bug in the system because you could go into the wine cellar and drink the wine and leave the bottle. <laughs> So uh, now we're going to have to put sensors in the cork. <laughs> and as long as you're going to that much trouble, you might as well sample the esters that make the wine you know, taste the way it does. And so before you open the bottle, you interrogate the cork. And uh, if that was the bottle that got up to 90 degrees because of a failure in the cooling system, that's the bottle you give to somebody who doesn't know the difference. <laughs> so this is really important, a practical thing to have around the house. Truly, we are going to see sensors uh, and networks of this kind becoming a common part of the internet environment. In the United States, there's a program called the Smart Grid, which is intended to allow energy consuming devices to report their usage and feed this back to you so you have some idea of what lifestyle decisions led to the electric bill at the end of the month. This feedback may also help all of us understand more uh, about the effects of our choices on the environment and on the usage of non-renewable resources. So this kind of sensor system is actually going to be very important. You could also see this in use for security purposes and things of that sort. But now I want to uh, shift again over to um, uh, artificial intelligence. This is just an example of a newspaper article that was written some time ago in Spain in El País. Uh, in Spanish, I handed the URL of that to Google Translate and it produced exactly the same layout, same images, but it translated the Spanish into English. And it actually did a fairly good job of that translation. We are reaching the point now where uh, we have the ability to translate text back and forth among some 50 different languages. The quality of the translation is still quite varied. Uh, the primary uh, avenue uh, to make this translation work is a statistical system. So this is not so much grammar and semantics and syntax as much as it is pattern matching. We have a large corpus of documents that are written in more than one language. And as you accumulate more and more of those samples, you can begin to statistically translate a phrase in one language to a phrase in another. The quality of the translation is based in part on the scale of the corpus 
that's used to produce these uh, statistical translations. We've reached a point at Google where uh, we probably can't get much better using purely statistical methods, so now we're beginning to incorporate grammar and semantics and syntax uh, together with the statistics in order to improve the results even more. Here's another, and this by the way is, is reaching the point now where we can do uh, speech recognition in multiple languages, translate that speech into text, then translate the text into other languages, and then render it again as sound using uh, text-to-speech uh, generation. So we are reaching not too far away from the point where you could imagine having two people communicating with each other, uh, each of them speaking a different language, and each hearing the language that they prefer. Uh, once again, we all know that even when we're speaking the same languages, we are capable of misunderstanding each other. And so you can imagine that these kinds of translations could also lead to some serious misunderstandings. Uh, again, an example of a technology that we have to understand and appreciate uh, strengths and weaknesses before we accidentally set off World War III as a consequence of a misunderstanding. Here's um, another example, it's called Google Goggles. This is our attempt to take imagery and to uh, do searches based on images rather than based on text. In this particular case, it's the San Francisco Bay Bridge, um, or Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, we are pretty good about well-known landmarks. We have a lot of images of the Eiffel Tower and uh, other things of that sort. Uh, we have a fair number of uh, book uh, covers and so when you're searching for books, sometimes they can help you figure out which book that is by the cover. I would like to add to the corpus wine labels because that's an important topic for me. So I'm hoping to contribute lots of pictures of labels of wine that I've consumed. Um, but you can tell that you need to build up quite a large corpus of images in order to, uh, to do this sort of thing. But we are reaching the point where this is becoming feasible. I'm sure many of you heard about the uh, self-driving cars. Uh, we have a fleet of something like two dozen cars in San Francisco. They have been driving themselves around the city for a couple of years now. Well over 200,000 miles have been uh, successfully driven without any accidents except for one. And uh, this was a rear ender and it wasn't our fault because it wasn't our, our car wasn't driving. Somebody else you know, ran into us. Uh, one thing I learned though about the self-driving cars that I hadn't fully appreciated I had thought they were completely autonomous. Now, we have sensors, ri ri LIDAR, uh, radar, uh, the uh, video cameras, GPS receivers, we have all kinds of things that we uh, use to capture what's the condition of the road uh, and the situation around us. And I thought all this was being done uh, by strictly onboard computing. And while there's plenty of onboard computing, it also turns out that these cars are reporting back to Google whatever it is that they are experiencing. So every car has access to the experiences of every other car. So for example, when you pull up to an intersection in a car that's never been there before, if any other cars have been there, it has access to that information. This allows the car to decide that this is a tree over here and not a pedestrian because every other car that's ever pulled up to that intersection is seeing the same thing in the same place and it hasn't moved. This way you don't have the car pulling up and waiting for the tree to cross the street because it doesn't know the difference between a tree and a pedestrian. So I mean, it's a trivial, silly example, but the idea here that we are accumulating knowledge in order to make all the cars function better is a really important concept. Machine learning, uh, for Google anyway, has been a very key part of our uh, systems whether it's for advertising or for searching or for, uh, for these kinds of recognition problems. So this is quite real. And the one thing I really uh, like about the self-driving car notion is that the cars are literally aware of what's going on around them 360 degrees constantly because of the way the sensor systems work. Unlike a human driver, which mostly sees you know, what's going on in front and occasionally looks at the rear view mirrors or turns to look to the side at the windows, the system is constantly aware of what's going on everywhere. Moreover, these cars can communicate with each other. So you can imagine in some complex situations where the cars are literally negotiating which car does what next. You know, for example, a four-way intersection, you can imagine a little negotiation where the cars finally decide which one goes through the intersection first. 
you don't have people who are distracted. You don't have you know, programs that get angry because they're late. Uh, this car just focuses on driving. So safety on the road may very much uh, rely on this. Now, I realize that I've been going on for almost three quarters of an hour, uh, and I'm fully capable of going on for another three quarters of an hour, but I'm not going to do that to you because I want to have some time for questions. I do want to draw your attention, though, to the fact that the internet is not necessarily as safe as we would like. It does have security problems. Many of them uh, are a consequence of weak software, and many of them are a consequence of the way we behave. Uh, for example, uh, let me go to this other slide here. Um, sometimes uh, we have operating systems that can be attacked through the network. Uh, many of the infections that we get, the viruses, the worms, and the Trojan horses, come in through the browsers. Because when you go to a web page, the way the web works is it copies a file, the home page file, and then it displays it, it interprets that file. Now, in the old, uh, early years of the World Wide Web, the only thing that file contained was text and imagery and some layout information so you could see a nicely laid out page. But in 2012, what happens is you download this file and it has executable software in it. It might be Java or JavaScript or Python or one of the other high level languages. The execution of those programs, the interpretation by the browser, can sometimes result in malware, badware, being stored on your machine, possibly infecting the operating system, uh, generating a worm that's, that uh, tries to use your machine to infect other machines. So this uh, problem here is that the browsers are naive, and one of the reasons that we designed and built and released the uh, source code of Chrome was to try to increase the level of paranoia uh, in, the, uh, in the browsers to try to minimize their, uh, uh, well, to, to maximize their ability to detect that there might be malware being downloaded. So uh, we have a lot of reasons why we have security problems. Passwords are another good example. Reusable passwords are a terrible idea for two reasons. First, they're reusable, which means if somebody finds them, they can use them and to pretend to be you. And second, we pick really bad passwords because we want to remember them. And because we need to remember them, we pick things that other people could guess. There are some people who actually use the word password as their password because it's easy to remember. The trouble is everybody else knows that and they can try to attack your account. So there are a lot of reasons why uh, we have these weaknesses. They're not all technical in, in nature. Some of them have to do with our uh, behavior uh, in these systems. And they are exploited by hackers, they're exploited by organized crime, and in some cases they're exploited by national level entities. So there are some big challenges here that we, uh, we have to cope with. If you worry about being attacked and you would like to figure out who did it, Attribution uh, is a big challenge because there are lots of ways of hiding not only your identity but hiding the origin of, uh, of an attack. So when we hear people talking about cyber warfare and cyber crime, I get nervous because I'm afraid that they will treat this cyber environment the same way they treat the real world. Uh, attribution is harder in this cyber environment and a mistake in attribution followed by a retaliation could lead to some very serious consequences. A trivial example would be a botnet attack where some large number of infected machines operated by a botnet herder launch an attack against a target. The owners of those infected machines don't notice anything is going on. There may only be a message or two per minute coming out of any one of those infected machines, but with enough of them, the target sees hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of messages a minute hitting them in a denial of service attack. If you were to naively try to find all of the sources of these messages, and let us even suppose you identify the elements of the botnet, and then launch a counterattack, the parties whose machines have been infected are not the instigator of the attack. If you counterattack and wipe out all their disk drives, the side effects of that could be very consequential. It could have economic effects, it could have certainly psychological ones like where's all my data. Uh, so a mistake like that could do a lot of harm 
to the wrong people. It gets worse. Let's suppose that your stance is that this is an, a national level attack. This is cyber warfare. And it turns out that the attacker masquerades as some other country. So country A launches an attack by pretending to be country B and it attacks country C. Country C launches a counterattack to what it thinks is the origin of the attack, B, when in fact it's really A. So B suddenly is under attack. If it's a cyber response, there again, a lot of collateral damage. It gets even scarier if you assert that you feel free to use conventional military response in the face of a cyber attack. If you haven't figured out who the origin is, you could literally wind up attacking your own country, again, with huge consequences. So we have major issues there that uh, I, I say uh, we need better forensic tools and we need to have international agreements about when and under what conditions responses will be taken to what is believed to be a cyber attack. Uh, I think, I, I'm, because of time, I'm not going to uh, go through more of that slide. And I'm going to just mention that we all understand that privacy is under assault uh, in this online environment. And it isn't just a question of the things that you do being captured by uh, companies like Google or Facebook or others. It's what we do to each other. And that little scenario about the uh, pyramid, for example, is, a, is an example of, of that. We're going to have to work our way through what privacy means in this online environment. Uh, so I want to, um, gosh, I really feel bad about the time. I do want to emphasize something uh, for you to take away and think about. We talk about the freedom of the internet. We talk about freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, the access to information. These are powerful, powerful benefits of this online environment. And yet, because we also know that, there are, that it's not entirely safe, I would like you to think about another kind of freedom that we should be striving for, which is freedom from harm. The issue here is how to protect the general public from various kinds of malware and uh, other kinds of attacks and harm, while at the same time preserving those other important freedoms. And this is a non-trivial problem, because you can imagine a very extreme situation where everyone is protected, but there, A, is no privacy, and there is no freedom of expression. Uh, and so we, and of course, the other extreme is everything is private, everyone is at risk, and, and there's no way to defend. So somewhere we have to figure out where is the right uh, balance between protecting the important freedoms that uh, are en ensconced in the UN Declaration of Human Rights, and at the same time find a way to protect people from the harms that they might experience. Now I'm going to skip one more slide and take just a few minutes uh, to give you uh, an update on where we are with the interplanetary extension of the internet. The first time I mentioned this idea was 1997 in Geneva. Everyone thought it was a joke. It isn't a joke. This is a serious piece of engineering that began at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory with some of my colleagues there uh, in 1998. Um, here was what we were trying to do is to figure out how to support manned and robotic space exploration with better networking than a point-to-point -point radio link, which is mostly how the spacecraft of the last 40 years have communicated back to Earth, point-to-point -point radios. But we knew that there were more complex kinds of configurations uh, and missions. And a good example of that is the rover mission that landed on Mars in 2004. There were two rovers, and they were not always able to communicate directly back to Earth from the surface of Mars. And in fact, we, we originally designed the mission to transmit data, 25, 28 kilobits a second, directly from the surface of Mars to what's called the Deep Space Network. There are three big, uh, 70 meter dishes in three places around the world, one in uh, Canberra, Australia, one in Madrid, Spain, and one in Goldstone, California. Those, uh, as the Earth is rotating, those big 70 meter dishes are looking out into the solar system, communicating point to point with spacecraft that are uh, on missions. So the original idea was to transmit data directly from the surface of Mars to that deep space network. But we ran into a problem when the radios were turned on, they overheated. This is a design problem, and so, of course, immediately the engineers said, well, then we're going to have to reduce the duty cycle 
of those radios to keep them from overheating and possibly harming other uh, components of the, of the spacecraft. And of course, the scientists are already berserk because they're only getting 28 kilobits a second of data. Now they're getting even less. But one of the engineers at JPL recognized that there was an X-band radio on board the spacecraft that could communicate directly with the orbiters that had been launched earlier in order to map the surface of Mars to figure out where the rovers should be sent. But those missions had been completed, but the spacecraft were still in operation. So they were reprogrammed. The rover was reprogrammed to transmit data up to the orbiters, and the orbiters were reprogrammed to capture the data and hold on to it until they got to the right place in their orbits to transmit data back to the deep space network. Now there were two big advantages. One of them is the X-band radio ran at 128 kilobits a second and since upgraded now to at least 256. Uh, so we had more data going back. The orbiters were out of the atmosphere of Mars and they had bigger solar antennas so they could transmit data to the deep space net at a higher speed as well. So now we have store and forward networking to support the delivery of data back from the rovers on Mars. That's how packet switching works. That's how the internet works. So when my colleagues and I started thinking about this, even before the 2004 Mars missions, we thought, well, we'll just use TCP IP. It works on Earth, it ought to work on Mars. And the answer is yes, it will work on Mars, and it will work in the spacecraft, but it doesn't work between the planets. The problem here is that the speed of light is too slow. <laughs> and, uh, when you look at the distance between Earth and Mars when we're in our respective orbits, when we're closest together, it's 35 million miles. If you do the arithmetic, it takes three and a half minutes for a radio signal to propagate from Earth to Mars when we're closest together. When we're farthest apart, it's 235 million miles. That's 20 minutes one way, 40 minutes round trip time. Those of you who have some appreciation for the way flow control works in TCP know that a 40 minute round trip time is not gonna work very well because you, know, you say, stop, I've run out of room. And it takes 20 minutes for that signal to get to the other guy. Meanwhile, he's pumping data like crazy. Packets are falling all over everywhere. It doesn't work. And there's another problem. It's called celestial motion. The planets are rotating and we haven't figured out how to stop that. So, so if you're on the surface and you're trying to talk and the planet's rotating, eventually you can't talk to the spacecraft because it's on the wrong side of the planet. So we literally had to design a whole new suite of protocols that we call delay and disruption tolerant networking. Those protocols are, have been iterated several times. They are on board the space station. They are on their way to Mars in the Mars Science Laboratory, which will land August 5th. The prototypes are on the existing uh, rovers and, uh, and orbiters. We even have put the protocols into a spacecraft called Epoxy, which has visited two comets in the last several years, and it's allowed us to do some fairly deep testing at about 80 or 90 light seconds away. So here's our theory. Oh, I guess I should tell you, on the right-hand side, this is the Phoenix lander that landed in May of 2008. It was at the North Pole, and there was no configuration that allowed us to transmit data directly back to Earth. And so we used the store and forward relay again in order to capture data. So here's what we hope will happen. We hope that as time goes on, all of the spacefaring nations will adopt these standardized uh, delay and disruption tolerant protocols. That means that uh, all those missions could theoretically interoperate because of standardization. It means that each mission, when it completes its primary scientific purpose, could be repurposed to be a node in an interplanetary backbone. So we're anticipating that we will literally accrete an interplanetary network over time as more and more missions are launched. Now, there's uh, a reason that we're hoping that, the, that this will uh, be accomplished, not merely to support uh, interplanetary communication and exploration, both manned and robotic. There's a new mission, uh, which is now sponsored by ARPA, the Advanced Research Projects Agency, which sponsored the original ARPANET design, it sponsored the internet design, it sponsored the architecture of the interplanetary protocols. Now it's sponsoring a study to design a spacecraft to get to the nearest star in 100 years. This is called the 100 YSS, 100 year spaceship. Uh, I'm part of the team that, uh, that won the, uh, the contract to do this design study. And we're not building anything, we're trying to design something. Now there are some real challenges trying to get a spacecraft in the nearest star. 
Problem number one, current propulsion systems would take 68,000 years to get to the nearest star. That's a little long even for a DARPA experiment. So first problem is getting more uh, horsepower, so to speak, uh, onto the spacecraft. Right now, the most likely configuration will be a nuclear reactor uh, plus uh, ion thrusters that could continually operate for a long enough time to accelerate up to about 20% the speed of light. Now clearly we'd like to slow down before we get to the destination, otherwise we'll get two pictures and that's it. <laughs> so uh, that's the first problem, propulsion. There's a navigation issue. Uh, remember that you know when you're going towards a star, its position is not where you think it is. It, because it took light time to get to you, so you have to do some mid-course navigation. And you can't do control that mid-course navigation from Earth very well, because the farther away the spacecraft gets, the longer it takes for you to say something. So you have to have a lot of onboard autonomy in order to make that work. And finally, there is the communication problem. How do I actually generate a signal from four light years away that I can detect on Earth? My first thought was I need the interplanetary backbone to build a synthetic aperture receiver about the size of the solar system to detect a laser signal coming from four light years away because no matter how collimated that laser signal is, it's going to have a beam spread that you know, covers about the size of the solar system by the time it propagates for four light years. But there's a, a new wrinkle in, in thinking, and this is very speculative. You all remember that when Einstein's theory was first proposed, there was a question about how to test it. And one of the tests was to see whether light was actually bent by the gravitational field of the sun. There was an eclipse of the sun that allowed the observation of a star of starlight coming near uh, the, uh, the solar uh, gravitational field. And you could actually calculate and see the light bend, bending because of that. So this means that the sun's gravitational field bends light. And therefore, when you get to the right distance away from the sun, you actually can create a gravitational lens. What this means is that by placing the right equipment from about 550 astronomical units away, each astronomical unit's 93 million miles, that's our distance from the sun, 550 AU and out will give you a gravitational lensing effect. So you can imagine placing a sensor that is at that gravitational lensing location in order to focus the light coming from, uh, in this case, Alpha Centauri. You could even imagine trying to deliver to Alpha Centauri another set of equipment using its gravitational lens so we could communicate in both directions. Now this is pure speculation. But I can tell you that this is so much fun because it's real engineering. It's not science fiction. In fact, engineering is turning science fiction into reality, and that's what we're trying to do. So that's where we are in the interplanetary and the interstellar work. I'll stop there. I know I've gone on for a whole hour. I'm happy to try to answer questions. Let me warn you that I'm hearing impaired, which may mean that when you get a microphone to ask a question, I may run up the aisle in order to lip read, so I'm not coming up to spit on you or anything like that. Uh, so anyway, thank you very much for your time this morning, and I look forward to our further discussions.